Hello everyone, welcome into the uh, Security Plus webinar. Uh, this particular webinar is going to be on crafting ACLs for a more secure network, or I guess really just crafting ACLs in such a way that you do secure your network, but you also can maintain your sanity and you don't make more work for yourself than you otherwise need to. So we are going to be doing a lot of sort of network based things today mainly on the Cisco devices, and we'll try to do an introduction to some of the syntaxes that we'll be using right out the gate. I'm excited to, uh, to start with this. Um, I think this is a fun topic, and hopefully this is something that will be uh, useful to everyone that actually needs to take the concepts that you learn in Security Plus and use them in the real world. So everyone ready? All right, let's do this. So moving over to our slides really quickly. All right, yeah, it seems like everyone's ready. Everyone's got their coffee. I've got mine. All right, yeah, our Security Plus webinar. And today we are talking about access control lists. Uh, before we dive into what I would consider pro tips or just regular tips about access control lists, I do want to do a brief review of what they are. So anyone in chat sort of know the three second definition of ACLs? Or do you have one that you would, uh, that you would explain it? to someone else using. They're really just a set of rules, right? They're just a set of rules. A connection filtering is a good way to put it. An access control list is a, a list of rules, hence the word list, that matches on traffic. And depending on the action we specify, it's either going to drop the traffic or allow the traffic through. That's an ACL at its most basic level. And they could be defined on host devices. They could also be defined on network devices. And we'll look at that actually pretty soon here in a demo environment. But an ACL looks something like this. It's a list of these rules that we call access control entries. And each rule is itself kind of comprised of different discrete parts. So first off, there's an action that we define. Is it allow? Do we allow or permit the traffic through or deny? Those are really our two main actions for an ACE. So we define the action that we want to take, and then we also define the match criteria. So what traffic do we actually want to perform this action on? You know, it could be by source or destination IP address or source or destination port or other characteristics of the traffic. But the match criteria and the action kind of come together to make an ACE or an access control entry, which itself is part of a list of ACEs that we then call an ACL. So, Probably, you know, this is kind of what you need to know for Security Plus, this sort of definition. You need to know what this is at a conceptual level, but the actual application is what we'll be focused on today. Oh, and one last thing about the ACL. You know, after all these ACEs, we've got this implicit deny at the end. And that is specific, that's there for traffic that, you know, after going through this access control list and checking all the match criteria and not finding any traffic that matches, you know, if the traffic doesn't match on any of these ACEs, ultimately we're gonna end up going through the whole ACL. And all the traffic that does reach the end of it is going to be denied implicitly, just sort of by default, right? So that's another key concept, another, a common thing with ACLs, pretty much ubiquitous. There's always this implicit deny where any traffic that we didn't explicitly match is going to be dropped. It's not gonna be allowed through. All right, so that's ACLs, brief description of them. Now moving more toward uh, just a, a, a brief primer on Cisco ACL syntax. We kind of got two different types of ACLs in Cisco, two main types. I don't know what the familiarity is in chat with Cisco devices, but uh, we've got these two main types. We've got standard ACLs and extended ACLs. Now, standard ACLs are conceptually really simple. They have their identifier, the ACL identifier. In this case, we're using a numeric identifier, some action that we define, and then match criteria. And what makes a standard ACL a standard ACL is that we're really just paying attention to the source IP address or the source IP address range. So in this case, we are, for the first statement, matching on this particular IP address, that's what the host keyword means. And then in this statement, we're matching on an entire network range. So for those of you that are a little familiar, what's this? It's kind of a weird looking subnet mask, right? 
It's not a subnet mask. So yeah, it's a wild card mask, exactly. So this is a wild card mask. It's uh, it can be calculated. There's reasons that we use a wild card mask instead of just a subnet mask uh, in Cisco. And we won't go into all that because again, not a Cisco webinar. However, it can be calculated very easily, right? You, you can just take for any given subnet mask that you want to use, you can just take 255.255.255.255 255 and subtract whatever subnet mask you want to actually make your statement for that will give you the wildcard mask so in this case we're actually using a slash 24 right so 255 255 255 dot zero is going to give us this wildcard mask so okay if you if you see that and you're wondering what it's all about that's what it is it, it just corresponds to that uh, particular subnet mask okay and this is kind of the, the syntax we'll be using throughout this webinar because we're going to be demonstrating this on Cisco devices. So uh, continuing on, and oh, by the way, before we go on, these standard ACLs, which only match on source address, not always the most useful. I don't want to, I don't want to um, kind of put these on the same footing. Standard ACLs, because they're only really looking at a source address, you can't really get that much granularity or specificity using ACLs like this, and you kind of use them in very specific use cases. So you might use them, for instance, for filtering traffic to the network device, like saying that only this IP address range is allowed to SSH into it. But we don't usually use this for the actual filtering of data, transit, uh, data traffic, so the, the traffic that's actually transiting the device. If you want to filter that type of traffic, you'd use something like an extended ACL. And this is, this is really what we're gonna be looking at today. These extended ACLs that allow us to match not just on the source address, but also on the destination address, as well as the source and destination port numbers. So this gives us a lot more granularity, a lot of the ability to be much more specific in our access control entry statements. So what is this doing here? By the way, anyone that wants to sort of decode it, and actually we could break it apart. Notice we've got our ACL identifier. We've got a, an action here, a permit statement for each of these, and we are matching on what? Well, we're matching on TCP traffic using these two ports from any source to this subnet, right? So we're basically allowing web traffic into a particular, a particular subnet here you know, this might be the type of ACL you define on potentially like a DMZ full of web servers where you want to allow web traffic through, just as, as an example, right? So this is an extended ACL. Uh, do you sort of remember the order because that's going to matter. Of course, we have our action first, but within the match criteria, we kind of got three different parts. We've got the protocol that we want to match on. We've got the source address and the destination address. And then also, depending on the protocol you're matching on, you might specify the port number as well. So, okay, that's that's the extended statement that gives us a lot more specificity. And if you're wondering about ACLs, if you haven't used them a lot, I actually made a, a resource for those of you in chat that might be newer to this, or even those of you that aren't. I made a sort of a long form written document about ACLs, about how they're constructed, the structure of them. So I'll post that in chat right now, just as a bit of review for you. Uh, something you could maybe tuck away as uh, potentially a sleep aid or something like that. All right, so how's everyone with, uh, with ACLs so far? Getting the general drift of it? So the actual concept of ACLs is pretty straightforward, right? The application is where it can get messy. So that's what we're here for today. We are more about in this webinar, bridging the difference between the conceptual understanding that you need for security plus and applied uh, the practical side of things, right? Actually applying this knowledge. So conceptual, is probably gonna be adequate when you go in to take the Security Plus exam. However, once you've taken it and you've got your Security Plus and you're expected to, to then apply it, that can be a little bit more a little bit more hairy. So we'll talk about some of the, the considerations beyond just how to make an ACL. So for instance, where should ACLs be placed? 
how can you keep them manageable and logging of ACLs? So when we deny or even permit traffic, I, do we want to log every time an AC, a particular access control entry is matched on? Or do we want to be more judicious with it? So we'll talk about kind of what I would consider good tips for all of these as we go through class or this webinar, I guess I should say. So we've got this demo topology looks something like this and we're going to look at three different areas here on the demo topology first thing we're going to do we've got a scenario over here that i'll go over momentarily but the first thing we're going to do is look at the edge like the the internet facing side of a router and how we might define certain acls there uh, in a kind of a scalable and manageable way then we'll look more toward the inside the filtering between internal subnets and how we can further restrict traffic and secure our environments by filtering inter-network communications, right? Because for instance, folks in the sales in the sales VLAN don't need to SSH into the server VLAN. So we'll look at how we can restrict stuff like that. And then finally, we'll take a brief look down at the host level of configuring host firewalls. And by using sort of these three different levels of filtering, we can get this additive security benefit where even if an attacker is able to circumvent a particular ACL or two, there's still additional obstacles in their way. So it's going to reduce their ability to get into your network first off, but also to pivot around your network and kind of uh, move freely within it. So our situation looks something like this. We are given a relatively vague task of allowing IPsec traffic to two internal servers. So that's actually strong swan. It's like an IPsec solution that you can get on Linux. So we have to allow IPsec traffic to those. And the rest of the guidance is just to secure the network. So that can be taken a lot of different ways. And we'll kind of, we'll look at basic configurations, but you can kind of take what we demonstrate here and run with it because there's a lot of additional things you could do. So going back to our, our syntax that we had demonstrated, allowing IPsec traffic to an internal server looks something like this. And you may or may not be familiar with IPsec, but it uses various ports, right? It uses two UDP ports and it uses two IP protocols. And you would actually, um, you could enable it like this. So we could say, uh, if we go down the list here really quickly, you know, we're enabling or we're, we're permitting traffic from uh, on UDP from any host to one of our IPsec servers on this particular port. And the second statement is much the same. It's just a slightly different port. Uh, so there's different modes or there's sort of different ports that IPsec might operate on. And then the next two statements are allowing two IP protocols that are again associated with IPsec. Do you need to know these? Should you already know these? No, not really. Uh, I, that's not something that you'd be expected to, to know for Security Plus. But uh, you just take my word for it, I guess. Like th This is what you'd want to do potentially to allow uh, traffic into an IPsec server. So we are permitting all that traffic. And then at the end of this list, we have a deny statement. So this is a very simple uh, ACL that you might put on your edge. And there's a few kind of things that I would change here. Actually, there's a lot of things that I would change here. But the first thing is, I wouldn't put that log keyword at the end. And we'll talk about logging. But what's the downside of logging, especially with edge ACLs that are facing the internet, where it's generating log entries every time we have a match on a particular ACE? Well, the internet is noisy. It's just going to generate a lot of logging information. So you don't necessarily want to, you don't necessarily want to be logging at the internet edge, right? So I'm going to take that log statement off. And this last statement here, even though we've got that implicit deny that we can potentially, uh, that we can rely on, not even potentially, we can rely on the implicit deny statement to deny all other traffic. The issue here is that we wouldn't keep track, we wouldn't get counts of how many denials we run into. So by explicitly denying that traffic at the end of an ACL, you can actually see how many times that, that ACE or, or these ACEs up here weren't matched on. So this is sort of the, where all the non-matching traffic is collected and denied. Yeah, huge log files, too much noise, it's a lot of stuff, absolutely. 
So this is a one server. This is one server, the ACEs that you would configure for a single server. Now we talked about two servers and if you wanted to do it for two servers and be very specific and not just allow entire ranges of IP addresses, it might have to look something like this. And so you can kind of see the problem here. I mean, do you consider this super readable? I guess it's kind of helpful that it's relatively in order. You might not find your, your ACLs in good order. Uh, so that's, that's like one benefit for it, but it's not super readable, right? There's a ton of lines and we can actually express this if we've got, at least in the case of more modern versions of Cisco IOS, uh, we can express this in far fewer statements. And that's what we'll, we'll demonstrate. So actually we can express all of that, the permit statements as well as those deny statements at the bottom with just two statements, two access control entries. So that is what we will be demonstrating actually right now. All right, so we're over here on HQ router. This is just our edge router. And uh, we are going to define a, an ACL that will allow the IPsec traffic through and, and probably some other traffic as well. We don't want to just allow IPsec traffic into our networks. So over here on HQ router, the first thing we wanna do is, is not go into ACL configuration mode. But what we can do is instead define these network objects that are kind of like variables that we can then use in access control lists. And the benefit there is if you define these objects, you can, you know, you put your, for instance, IP addresses of the servers in those. And then if you ever need to add one, you don't have to modify the ACL at all. You just add a, another IP address to a particular network object. So this is kind of a cool feature that makes management of ACLs a lot simpler. So first off, we've got our two IPsec servers. Let's define those really quickly. And on Cisco devices, you would use object group network, and we'll just call it IPsec servers. And then within that object group, we will use the host command to define the IP addresses for each of the two servers. So it's host, and I think the IP address, do I have it written down anywhere? Yeah, 85. Dot twelve dot five dot two and five dot three. So now we've got this 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 uh, object that we'll be using in the ACL as opposed to these individual IP addresses. And again, the benefit here is you can always come back in and add or remove IP addresses within this object. And what else do we need to define for this ACL, or what object do we need to define still? Well, probably the most important one here is going to be a service object, actually. And I guess that wasn't the best question because you might not have known that a service object was an option. But yeah, we'll say IPsec protocols as this particular service object. And within this, we can actually define the ports and protocols you know, as a group that we wanna use in these access control entries. Yeah, so the ports and the services, absolutely. So we will first off say UDP 500 and UDP 4500. And then we can actually just say AHP and ESP. Again, those are those two IPsec protocols. You wouldn't be uh, expected to know that there's sort of shortcut keywords on a Cisco device, but you can use those if you'd like to. So we define those, those two UDP ports and those two IPsec protocols within this group called IPsec protocols. And now we can actually make an ACL that allows that IPsec traffic in. And it would just be a single line, actually, the access control entry to allow IPsec traffic to those two servers, just one line. But we probably, at the internet edge, do want to allow a little bit more traffic in. So just to keep it remotely realistic, I'm gonna add a bit of, a bit of traffic that we would expect to be coming from the internet. So I'm just gonna make one more object group. And it's gonna be another service object group. I'm just gonna call this common traffic, I guess. Common traffic. And what's common traffic that we might expect, you know, at our internet edge? I'm just gonna do web traffic, but you can imagine DNS, uh, web traffic, email traffic, all that stuff. And we can define that as well. We'll be using that in the same ACL. So let's do that. 
And first thing, I, another thing I want to demonstrate though, and I'm going to forget to do this throughout, it's good to comment on these and explain what they're there for. So you could say, you know, description here, normal traffic or common traffic, whatever, right? It's good to add descriptions as you go. So yeah, some traffic that we might want to allow is port 80 TCP, port 443 TCP, right? And notice that I use the source keyword here because we care about when we're applying this ACL coming, you know, it's an inbound ACL from the internet. The source port for web traffic is going to be the port that the web server is using, right? So it's going to be 80 or 443 in this case. And uh, same goes for uh, DNS, for instance, UDP source 53. And maybe we want to allow IC, like we want to allow people to ping out to Google to make sure that they've got connectivity. We could also say like ICMP echo reply, All right? So this is the traffic that we'll allow through to our internal subnets in addition to that IPsec traffic. With all that defined, now we can actually go in and make an access control list. And this is where it gets kind of cool. So as opposed to that huge list that we saw for just the IPsec connections, this is going to be a lot more readable and a lot smaller because we're going to be using these sort of variables that we defined. So let's uh, do IP access list. Extended, of course, we don't want to be using a standard one. And we'll just call it, it's good to use a descriptive name. I'm just going to say internet edge in. And now within this, we will specify our actual access control entries. So first off, I'm going to permit. What's the what are the what's the order of the three of the three uh, bits <laughs> of match criteria that uh, we use in extended ACLs? Does everyone remember? First thing is going to be the protocol. So we're going to permit the object group IPsec underscore protocols, and then we want to permit the, the source, which is not an object group. We just want to allow any IP address for this particular example. So we'll say from any to our IPsec servers. And it looks like I've got a typo here. Oh, it's, it's uh, one second, bear with me. It's the joy of, uh, of live demos, right? Object group, IPsec, servers. All right, so that's going to allow it. And uh, I apologize if it's kind of hard to see, but basically what we're doing is we're matching on those IPsec protocols. We are saying any source to those IPsec servers we're going to allow. And that's it. So that's uh, that's our first access control entry. Now the other thing we might want to allow in is just general traffic, like we defined in the the uh, network object previously. So we could just as easily say, you know, permit. I think it was common traffic. Uh, object group common traffic from from any source maybe to any source, or you could get more granular and specify the internal subnets using an object group too. But we could just say that, you know, permit object group, common traffic, any, any. And then finally at the network edge, you might want to actually have a deny statement that will tell you how many packets are getting denied. Like we get these counts and I'll show it to you in a bit, but we'll just say deny IP any, any for the remainder here. And once again, I didn't uh, remember to, to put a remark in. That's kind of a, a pattern for me. But you could also add remarks to these ACLs to explain what they're actually doing. So we'll say like allow IPsec and common traffic. And that, now we've got this, this remark in the configuration for anyone that's trying to figure out what we were doing down the line. All right, so we've defined this, this access list if we show it, and we kind of, it's kind of wrapped a bit here, but you can see we've got these uh, sequential entries. The first one's pre-in IPsec protocols. 
The second one's permitting any common traffic. And the third one's denying anything else. And notice we've already got some matches on that third one. So what's the last step? We have to actually apply it to something, right? So it looks like, well, was this already applied, I wonder? Let's do show run. Yeah, this actually, uh, one second. We'll start at interface and take a look at this. All right, so maybe not, not the best example because I actually had already applied that ACL. <laughs> but uh, if I had remembered to remove that configuration, of course, we would have had to apply it first. And probably the first indication that that was already applied to the interface was that we were already getting hits on it, right? So we didn't have to do anything for this demo. You know, in the real world, when you craft a new ACL, you have to actually apply it to an interface. Exactly, exactly. And uh, save your config, absolutely, you wanna do that on a regular basis. All right, so this is actually now going to, it's now matching on traffic. And it's probably, uh, if we do a, if we do a, the proper command here, come on. Notice that now we've got 30 matches for our denies here. So we can kind of see what's going on. So absolutely. So VLAN interface or physical port interface, uh, you, uh, there's actually, we'll talk about that when we look at uh, VLAN uh, sub interfaces. Uh, that's, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk to that. Actually, what this is being applied to here specifically is the, the physical interface facing the internet. Okay, so to, to summarize here, even though I forgot to remark, it's kind of a, a do as I, well, it's kind of a recommendation that I try to abide by, but not always successfully. You want to, use comments this one i always forget but beyond that named acls right so named acls and let me go back really quickly uh, to that question if you put it in a vlan should it be out it depends on the direction of the traffic that you're interested in all right, so to, let, me, let me circle back to this slide because we'll, uh, we'll take a, a momentary uh, break from the content uh, after this slide. So optimal placement of the, the ACL. This is something that's really important to think about. Now we applied that ACL or we would have applied that ACL on the outside interface facing in, right? Inbound. And why is that beneficial? All right, so to just draw this out, you know, we had internet traffic coming in and we applied the ACL for that inbound traffic, but we could have maybe applied it internally for outbound traffic, right? On the, the internal side of the, the router, an internal interface. Yeah, because it's kind of, what we want to do where possible is drop the traffic earlier rather than later. So if it's going to get dropped anyway, we might as well just drop it immediately before it goes into the router and the router has to think or even worse, before it goes into our network and bounces around for a while before it's ultimately dropped anyway. So what you want to do uh, typically is drop as possible as early as possible. You know, block early, uh, with you know exceptions depending on on the layout of your network. So there's always going to be sort of an asterisk. However, generally speaking, it's better to for conservation of resources, for conservation of both router resources and sort of network bandwidth. Uh, to just drop the traffic immediately. So in terms of manageability, we looked at using named ACLs and the benefit there, I demonstrated the syntax, but one of the main benefits there of using named ACLs, in addition to the fact that you can actually see a name as opposed to a number, the other main benefit is that you can change them much more easily because you've got these sequence numbers that you can, like for instance, remove a particular ACE and replace it using. So named ACLs are easier to manage and they're also more readable. But I think that probably the most important thing here is the actual use of network objects, which allowed us to make a, an ACL that had even more sort of functionality, more different types of traffic it was matching on, but it was only three total statements. So it's, uh, it's just significantly easier to read, but also just easier to manage as you can imagine. All right. 
So let's uh, quickly talk about Security Plus as a class. And uh, so Security Plus, of course, the, the class itself is going to align with the Security Plus content, currently SYO 501. And in terms of prerequisites for the class, you really don't need to have, for instance, prior certifications, but I do recommend you know, prior certifications, prior experience, because it can be helpful. For instance, in this webinar, we're talking a lot about networking and having a, a sort of a baseline understanding of networking a foundational understanding can be really useful as you go into Security Plus so that you aren't filling in gaps, uh, filling in more gaps than maybe you need to. So actually we have a great class that leads into Security Plus really nicely. Uh, that's Network Plus taught by Doug Bassett, great class. So you could, you know, that's while not a requirement, it would be a recommendation. And in general, as long as you've got an interest in the attack and defense of systems, uh, you'll be able to, uh, it will make studying for Security Plus and passing Security Plus a lot easier. Right, so actually being interested in what you're studying is helpful, of course. <laughs> and what do you take away from Security Plus? a very broad understanding of all kinds of different Security Plus topics, right? Or security topics, not just Security Plus topics, but you know, it could be on the technical level from you know, identifying vulnerabilities and how they, how they pop up to how they're mitigated uh, to actually defending against different vulnerabilities and attacks. So it covers both you know, red team, the attacker's perspective, as well as blue team, the defender's perspective. And we do spend a lot of time talking about vulnerabilities and attacks, but it would be a little depressing if you just focused on that. So we also look at a lot of the different defenses, kind of like we are in this webinar. So we will, uh, you will take away the ability to, or in the understanding of defenses like network traffic filtering, host hardening, physical controls, even organizational controls, right? And your organization benefits as well because you'll be able to secure their infrastructure, their hosts, their networks, their cloud infrastructure. You'll have a good understanding of what needs to be done. And redundancy for, for availability reasons, we talk a lot about that. So you can make sure that the systems aren't just secure from attackers, but that they remain available, which is really important with security. And just beyond that, secure development practices, uh, secure uh, sort of design of your networks, the ability to think about and maybe inform security policies, right? So you get a lot of broad understanding from Security Plus that benefits both you and your organization. And if this is something that interests you, you know, we've got this nice discount code here, Security Plus 27, that, you know, you can get 250 bucks off. It's not too bad. And if you're interested, this does expire on August 7th. So it's like seven days from now. So there's a bit of a time limit there, uh, but, uh, Nice little, uh, nice little discount if, you, if this is something that you find interesting. And you can always reach out to Mike here. Here's his contact information uh, if you'd like to. And by the way, lots of other classes too. Yeah, it looks like we've got some CCNA students in here. Yeah. Oh, hey, Doug. And Doug's in here. So we've got lots of other classes too. And if you're interested in security, we've got various security classes coming up. But if you're just if you've got more general interests or more specific interests, you know, we've got classes from Microsoft to of course Cisco to uh, automation classes, orchestration classes, Python, and so forth. Right. So if you have an interest, we probably have a class that aligns to it to some extent. I'd recommend, you know, network analysis with Wireshark. That's a great one for people that are taking a security track. Uh, CCNA itself is a great class because, uh, for security that is, because it gives you a lot of the foundational network networking understanding that's important for having a career in security. So lots of, uh, lots of classes to choose from here. And uh, live classes too. All right, so we've got coming up, A+, I'll be teaching that next week, but we've got a ton of other classes. And live classes are fun because you can actually interact live with the instructor. And generally speaking, uh, I recommend attending live if you have the ability to. And you can see we've got a pretty good selection of live classes coming up. So uh, if, you, um, if you're interested in any of these, you know, definitely think about signing up for some of those. All right, continuing on. Kind of back to our technical content here. Internally, you know, between subnets, 
we can also define ACLs to, to filter traffic. And one of the reasons to do that, what's a good reason to do that? Well, one, uh, one reason, and really the main reason that comes to mind for me is to restrict the ability of an attacker or even like, yeah, an attacker, we'll just say an attacker, to pivot from one less protected subnet, like the sales subnet, to a potentially more protected subnet. So you can actually filter traffic, filter specific types of traffic uh, that you really don't want to be going from sales to your server subnet or whatever, you know, it, whatever the case may be. So internally, restricting traffic between subnets works the same way. We're applying it to maybe different interfaces, targeting different source and destination IPs, but the, the general sort of pattern here holds. So let's go back to our demo machine and look at how we can maybe define some, define some ACLs, define an ACL uh, to filter traffic from two subnets. And actually in this demo, we've got a sales subnet and a server subnet. And we want to really restrict traffic coming from sales and going to the server subnet. Uh, in the real world, you'd probably want to be permitting certain traffic too, because how useful are servers if no one can reach them? But in the demo world, we're just going to be focusing in on uh, denying certain traffic. So moving back over to our demo, let me quickly clear the screen here. So again, we've got two subnets. And what we want to do, actually what I could do is, let me do show object group. I've already defined the object groups just so you don't have to watch me define them during the webinar. But we've got this, this object group that is the VLAN servers, the server VLAN, I guess I should say, as well as the sales VLAN. And to restrict traffic from one to the other, same exact process, but what kind of traffic would you really want to know about if, uh, if, someone, if it was going from sales to the servers? Mm, SSH traffic, you know, how often does Mike from sales need to SSH into a server? You know, that's something that's probably not great. Maybe DNS like server traffic where we're getting like DNS responses or NTP traffic going from sales into the server subnet. There's lots of things that you wouldn't want, right? So we'll just demonstrate a few. First thing we got to do is maybe pick some protocols to filter explicitly. And we can do that by, you know, again, going to an object group. In this case, a service object group. And we'll call this uh, suspect protocols. So suspect protocols could be SSH. So we could say TCP 22. And another two that just come to mind for me that we'll, I guess we'll use are uh, UDP. Fifty three and one twenty three for DNS and NTP because we shouldn't really have any servers or any devices sending traffic from UDP ports fifty three or one twenty three on our sales subnet, especially not into our server subnet. So we'll call that suspect traffic. And of course, you can get a lot more specific with this, add a lot more entries. So exiting back out, we'll now define an access control list that we will use to filter traffic specifically from sales to the server subnet. So we'll say IP access list extended, always extended for this type of stuff. We could say like VLAN five in. So this will be traffic that's entering the router from VLAN five. And we will first because we're just gonna deny traffic here, even though in the real world, you would of course want permit statements. Uh, we'll circle back to that after we get this going. But the first thing we'll do is deny the protocols that we're interested in, suspect protocols, from our object group, which is uh, the sales VLAN to the destination, which is the server VLAN. And what did I forget here? Oh no, one second. 
So we got object group. All right, deny object group, suspect protocols. All right, two, two. Okay, what am I missing here? Does anyone see what I'm missing here? Like, I can't tell. So VLAN 5 sales, right? That's our source to our object group. Oh, is that what, it, maybe that, no, that's not what happened. All right, to our object group, VLAN 10 uh, servers. There, okay, I don't know what that was. See, and it wasn't the ports because because that was all defined in the object group, the uh, service object group. So I'm not sure what it was uh, what it was getting at there. Probably a typo somewhere. But anyway, we got there, right? So we're denying this particular traffic from from sales to the server subnet. But what I want to do is actually remove that, even though I'm kind of scared to now. What I want to do is add a little bit of extra information, a little one extra keyword actually. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, typo figures. So I'm gonna have one more keyword here, specifically log. All right, so this is gonna log traffic that's denied. And then we can add another deny statement for like generally general denied traffic. But what we wanted to define here in this particular ACE was really suspicious traffic, like you know forged UDP or NTP packets or SSH traffic, the stuff that we really want to be informed about. That's what this ACE was for. And then we could also just deny traffic more generally from sales to the server VLAN. All right, so we'll just say deny uh, IP from the object group VLAN 5 sales. I'll make sure to actually be very deliberate while I'm typing this time to the object group. Mm. VLAN, and I said that and I immediately to the object group VLAN 10 servers, right? All right, so now we are denying all the traffic basically to between the VLANs or, or from the sales VLAN to the destination server VLAN, which is great. And we're also getting log entries for suspicious traffic. But if we applied this, at the router interface where all VLAN 5 traffic is entering, what is going to happen? What's going to happen to any traffic that goes into this interface now from VLAN 5? Yeah, I wish spell check was a thing, right? That would be way easier. Well, we've got a deny statement on this ACL. We've got another deny statement. And then we have an implicit deny. So what's actually being allowed? Yeah, it's just going to deny everything. So the last statement we have to actually configure in something that might be easy to forget is you have to configure some permit statement and in the case of VLAN 5 we want to at least to we want at least to permit traffic out to you know the internet at large if not uh, the the server VLAN so the way to do that would be you know permit ip from the object group sale mm, what is it VLAN 5 underscore sales to, you know, any, basically. Okay, so let's kind of double check this. All right, so that looks pretty good to me. Yeah, of course we need a permit statement, otherwise just everything gets, uh, gets denied. So in this case, we're allowing, basically VLAN 5 can communicate with anything except the server subnet. And you might not want to be that broad, right? But uh, for, for a demo, we're just gonna say, yeah, you can talk to anyone else. All right, and the last thing you have to do is actually apply this to an interface. And we probably already have it applied to an interface if I had to guess. But uh, if we go to interface gig ether, well, let me do, let me just verify which interface it's on, yeah. So if we go to internet uh, interface gigabit ethernet, and we've got a specific interface for this VLAN, and we can actually apply it now, IP access group, and it was called what? VLAN 5 in, I think, right? All 
Okay. So I actually remembered the name of the ACL, so that's great. But now this is going to filter traffic coming into that interface, that particular sub interface for this VLAN. And if you don't have a permit statement there, then basically that VLAN is cut off from the world, right? All right, so this is just an example of segmentation. Obviously, there's a lot of things we could do to improve this. Uh, for one, get a little bit more granular about what's allowed into the server subnet, because again, servers aren't that useful if no one can communicate with them. All right, continuing on here. Actually, one takeaway that I want to mention before we move on to just looking at Linux very briefly is that having, for that really suspicious traffic, having a deny statement as well as log is potentially really useful because that can actually give you a, uh, a an early warning. When someone's on your network, they've maybe compromised a host in the sales network and you're trying to, and you, uh, of course, would want to know about that. So, it, you know, that's a, it's a good thing to potentially implement. All right, so continuing on. Our third sort of uh, our third layer of ACLs that we're going to look at hosts. So there's lots of different technologies for filtering traffic at the host level by operating system. Uh, what, what are some common ones? What are some common host uh, host firewalls? On the Linux side of things, it could be IP tables. Uh, they've got nicer front ends like UFW. That's what we're going to look at very briefly. Uncomplicated firewall. Yeah, firewall D. Yeah, so that's the Linux side of things. Of course, Windows has Windows firewall. And uh, the syntax always varies a little bit between all the different types of firewall solutions. But if you understand how ACLs work, the, and the, the only difference really is syntax. You can kind of reverse engineer or figure it out with a little bit of Googling, right? So we will look at a Linux server. And let's just say, let's say this is one of our IPsec servers. What are some of the statements that we might want to allow? Or what, what's, uh, what ACL statements would we want to configure on the Linux server, potentially? There we go. Well, you know, if it's if it's the IPsec server, we'd probably want to allow things like UDP port 500, UDP port 4500. Uh, probably we'd want to allow SSH traffic, but maybe not from every subnet. So let's uh, look at this with from the UFW perspective. This is one of many different firewall kind of front ends that you can use with Linux. Uh, UFW is kind of simple. And notice that I'm running as root. So by the way, just from a security plus perspective, not great. From a demo perspective, a little easier than having to enter my password constantly, right? So we'll uh, let's make some rules. So we could say, yeah, you know, don't do that in the real world, but this is a demo. Yeah, so the sudo uh, is what you typically would want to use. However, for whatever reason, this just keeps prompting me for a password and it's not remembering it. So just for, for ease of use here. So UFW, uh, what would we want to allow in? Well, first off, let's deny. You know, there's there's no harm in denying traffic from the sales subnet. So we could say, you know, explicitly deny this traffic. So notice the difference in syntax, even though it's kind of it's kind of getting at the same thing. The order is a little different. We aren't using wildcard masks. We're using just uh, CIDR notation. But we'll say deny this particular subnet or actually from this subnet to, we could specify the actual IP address of this server, or we could just say any, you know, any traffic arriving at it is going to have it as the destination IP address. So that's kind of up to you. To any on port 22, make sure that this is working properly, port 22 with the protocol of TCP. Yeah, so this is, Something weird is happening with the uh, with my console here. Let me try this. Get rid of these two. All right, so let's just try this all over again. <laughs> my console is kind of getting a little wonky for some reason. I'm not sure what the deal is there. All right, so we'll say UFW deny from 172.16.0.0 24 to any IP address on port uh, 22 protocol TCP. 
There we go. Okay. So I don't know. It was doing some wonky thing with the uh, the console, but you can um, you can define it really. It's identical conceptually to what we saw on the Cisco side of things. It's just a different order, a slightly different syntax, right? So we've denied that. Now no one from sales can actually SSH into the system. And we might actually want to make a more general deny statement and say deny all SSH traffic or maybe just say make a very limited permit statement for just traffic from the management network. So there's a lot of different ways you could go with it. Ideally, you don't want to be going through and just blacklisting IP address ranges. You want to uh, deny everything by default and then poke holes in your firewall as necessary. So that's an example of uh, our syntax. Another example might just be, you know, UFW permit from any to any port 500 protocol UDP, right? UFW allow, is it allow? That might catch me. Yeah, so in the case of UFW, we're using a different word. That's, that's the kind of variation that you'd see between different ACL types or, or firewall types. All right, so by defining these ACLs and filtering traffic at different levels within our networks, at the edge, like all incoming traffic, you know, within our networks, between VLANs, and we looked at one way, but there's some cooler ways to do it, like zone-based firewalling, and you can do it in, in some inter more interesting ways. But, you know, filtering between different subnets within your network is going to reduce the ability of attackers to pivot, to get into other networks. And then on the host level as well, you know, even if we've got filtering between subnets, if an attacker is able to compromise one host on, you know, a given subnet, they may be able to pivot to a different host on the same subnet. So you could uh, protect it potentially by using host ACLs and really restricting the traffic uh, that you want to allow to only what's really absolutely necessary. All right, so this is all to say, really long story summed up. You now this is defense in depth, right? Multiple layers of ACLs and uh, each one is providing additive security benefits for you. So in terms of monitoring, we did look at how you can configure logging for ACLs on a Cisco device. You just add the log keyword. And some people in chat rightly answered that you really wouldn't want to have that on a public facing, sort of internet facing ACL. And the reason is you're going to get lots of denials because there's just so much background radiation. So maybe not so much on the internet facing side of things, but internally there are some good uh, things that you could potentially look at. And so we, we had like a canary access control entry that we looked at that was just very potentially su suspicious traffic that we wanted to log. And then we sort of denied everything else as well. Uh, but what types of things might you want to actually log when you're trying to balance the intelligence that you're getting, the, the logging information that you're getting you know, with the ability to actually consume and like analyze all of that? What are some important things? Well, probably you want to prioritize important protocols to important servers. I feel like that's like not the best explanation, but you know, SSH traffic to a critical server, that's something that you would probably want to log if, if we see that uh, going from uh, a production VLAN, something like that. So you ideally would want to log internally and with a preference for maybe management protocols to critical resources, for instance, right? Yeah, and there's, some, there's tons of other things you could potentially be looking for. Repeated attempts, port scanning attempts. Yeah, ports 20, 21, 22, maybe even 23, right? So that'd be like FTP, SSH, Telnet, RDP, 3389, right? So there's lots of different management protocols. It depends on your particular situation, of course, but you wanna really be judicious, very conservative in logging because not only does it generate a ton of information potentially, but what's the other downside of, of logging a lot? What, there's a, actually an impact on your network devices, for instance. It's gonna use up more CPU resources and potentially you know, slow things down unnecessarily. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hopefully no one's using Telnet. All right, so just to summarize here, kind of the, the broad strokes of some of the things that we talked about in this webinar, placement of the ACL does matter. And 
ideally we want to drop early and we want to drop before the, the router processes a packet only to just drop it later, for instance. So ideally inbound on the router is where you'd want to apply ACLs so that they don't waste cycles uh, doing things with the packets, maybe NAT translation or whatever else the case may be. So dropping early is great for the routers, just great in general so you don't have doomed packets floating around your, your network potentially. Manageability. So we looked at named ACLs and we looked at network objects and we tried to look at remarks, but that one's an easy one to forget. So remarks, you know, where possible, uh, it's, it's great to add remarks. Just like when you're trying to read a, some code it, and uh, it's got comments, you know, same thing goes for an ACL where it does make things a lot easier for both other people, but also for you down the line when you're trying to figure out what you were, what you were doing a few months ago, right? So manageability, uh, named ACLs, remarks, network objects, layering of ACLs is going to give you a defense in depth, at least for this, this, particular, uh, this particular domain, network traffic. Uh, so you want to layer them where possible and you really want to be conservative or judicious with logging. You really want to log the important stuff, but if you go overboard, you're never going to be able to find the sort of needle in the haystack, right? Find the actual security incident amongst all the, the, the noise, right? So let's, uh, let's continue on here. And great question in chat. Is there a site that has commonly used ACLs? Absolutely. Uh, I will link this again, but uh, at the bottom of this document, there is a list of additional resources, links, and Cisco has some commonly used ACLs that you can use for reference if you'd like to use that. All right, so putting it all together. So why do we need to do this? Because we don't want, we don't want malicious traffic on our networks. We don't want, um, we don't want people having an easy time when they hack us. We want to put a lot of obstacles in their way. So we want to restrict traffic to just as what, what is necessary, conserve resources internally, uh, internally on the router as well as within our network as a whole. And the skills that we looked at, one of the most important things isn't so much this stuff, that's important, but uh, the ongoing management of ACLs, that's where it gets really, really complex. As Because we looked at a toy environment, but in the real world, we're talking about a lot more protocols, a lot more IP address ranges, a lot more just change over time. And so manageability is particularly important with ACLs. So hopefully, you know, if you take one thing away from, from this webinar, it's using like network objects and making those ACLs manageable by putting a little effort in at the beginning of uh, configuring access control list, you can save yourself a ton of effort down the line. And in terms of logging, of course, the doing that effectively allows us to respond to security incidents effectively um, or actually even know that they occurred. So these are kind of good skills to have when you're implementing uh, ACLs. So very briefly, let's talk about if you are planning on taking the Security Plus exam anytime soon. Uh, let's talk about just some tips I have. First off, you want to actually attend, you know, either live or recorded sessions where we go through all the different Security Plus uh, topics. You know, this was a very networking and ACL oriented webinar, of course, but in class, we're gonna be covering a broad range of Security Plus topics. So I definitely recommend actually, you know, attending class or watching class and practicing. So I don't know, I would guess that most people that watch this webinar, for instance, aren't going to remember all the details of the syntax and so forth without a little bit of hands-on practice, right? And the same goes for a lot of different security tools and technologies. So actual practice is a great way to not just remember the material, but also to make it concrete. Instead of some concept that you've learned for Security Plus, it's something that you can actually do, right? Practice is really important. So refer to those exam objectives regularly. That's my number one tip for all CompTIA exams. They give you a list of every single thing that you could run into. So print it out and just check things off and you will uh, not run into any surprises when you go to take Security Plus or any other CompTIA exam. So yeah, those exam objectives are great for the entire duration of studying for a CompTIA certification. I use them ex uh, extensively. Practice exam, always good to take one, but I'd say take it a week or two before you take the actual exam 
because it's going to tell you where your strengths and weaknesses are and then you can prioritize studying the areas where you have the most room for improvement, right? So you can actually do it more effectively uh, and you can, uh, that's my personal recommendation, right? You have to prioritize and really uh, not spend time relearning what you already know well enough. And of course, if you're taking Security Plus or any other CompTIA class that I teach or anyone else teaches, you can always reach out to instructors for mentoring uh, but uh, again, this is like on the, the, the list twice because I think it's really important. You really want to review those objectives and even just check things off as you go. Can you explain them in a few sentences? That's really, that's going to be a big indicator of, of possible success. If you know what each acronym or each term refers to and you can explain it in a few sentences, you're in good shape. So understand the topics and concepts, always good for an exam. Uh, you know, explaining the bullet points in a few sentences, doing well on the practice exams. Obviously you want to reach a certain threshold. It doesn't have to be exactly 90%, but you want to be doing consistently well on any practice exams or quizzes that you're taking and uh, comfortable or being comfortable with the skills I showed you in class in this webinar. Not so much the skills, the concepts behind ACLs are important if you're taking the Security Plus exam. The skills are important once you've taken it and you actually have to go apply it, right? So the things like manageability become much more important when you are af like after the exam, when you're actually configuring ACLs. So being comfortable with concepts like these naturally going to be important since you'll be tested on them. And then after you're done with the exam, depending on your, your test taking pattern, you might want to take a nap. At least I always do after tests. I always stay up too late the night before. So take your nap, maybe get some coffee, clear your mind. And then once that's done, you've got lots of other security related content uh, that we offer that you could potentially continue on with if you, if you find Security Plus enjoyable. We got uh, both CompTIA security courses as well as ethical hacking, which is another great course. CCMP security tracks if you wanted to take the more Cisco networking route. Palo Alto, Sonic, Sonic Wall, lots of different things, right? And actually, just more generally, we've got like 180 plus courses. So even if maybe security isn't your number one passion with IT, regardless of what you're interested in, whether it's the cloud or automation or X, Y, or Z, we've probably got classes that are related to them, related to what you're interested in, or at least or yeah, at least related to, if not directly about what you're interested in. So it's, it, you know, after your exam, maybe just uh, poke around and see what your, your options are. It doesn't even necessarily need to be security related, although that would be my personal preference. And once again, just to uh, remind you, the discount code here, security plus 27 for $250 off. And just remember that does expire kind of next week, right, in about seven days. So there is a bit of a time limit there. You can always reach out to Mike if you're interested in Security Plus or any of the other courses that we offer. So thank you, everyone. I think that's actually it for for the slides, the material. Thanks, everyone, for joining me on a, on a Friday to talk about ACLs. <laughs> so hopefully your Friday, the remainder of your Friday goes really well. Same goes for your weekend. I hope everyone stays kind of safe and healthy out there. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.